Good evening. Tonight we have two Bible readings. The first is from Luke chapter 12, verses 13 to 21. And this can be found on page 894 in the Pew Bibles. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Then he said to them, Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in in an abundance of possessions. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, You have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, You you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich towards God. The second reading is found in Luke chapter 19, verses 1 to 9 on page 902 of the Pew Bibles. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house because this man, too, is a son of Abraham. Thanks, Charlotte. Uh, Can I encourage you to keep your Bibles open there at uh, Luke chapter 12? And the uh, outline of the talk is on uh, the bulletin sheet on the back page as well, if you'd like to follow along. Well, as Reuben uh, said earlier, we're continuing tonight on the series that Keith began last week on uh, something called Modern Idolatry. And tonight I'm going to speak on the issue of greed, which sounds like a lot of fun, doesn't it? Well, it may not be fun, but hopefully it won't be boring. Here's what I want to do tonight. It's basically four things I'd like to do. First of all, I want to talk about what I mean by idolatry. Secondly, I want to talk about uh, a little bit about economics and why all of us here are prone to being greedy. Uh, Then we'll look at how Jesus changed the life of a particularly greedy uh, fellow And we'll see how the gospel actually makes it possible for us also uh, to resist greed. And then finally, I want to finish with some practical ways for us to avoid greed. So, okay, as we get into it, let's pray. Father God, you are uh, a rich God and you're also a generous God. And you have um, uh, made it so that we can live right now in this prosperous part of the world in Australia And we thank you for that. We thank you for your grace towards us. Father, we confess that we um, are often short-sighted and prone to be greedy. And I pray, Lord, that you will speak to us tonight about that. I pray, Lord, um, that you will help me to speak clearly. I pray that your Holy Spirit will speak to our hearts. Father, we pray that uh, we might leave the place tonight uh, better equipped to follow you, uh, to live lives and to have characters that reflect that of your son, Jesus, in whose name we pray these things tonight. Amen. All right, so just a couple of uh, quick uh, confessions before we begin. Most of what I'm going to be talking about tonight um, is inspired by a book uh, called, a book by Tim Keller called Counterfeit Gods, and also uh, another book um, by uh, Gordon Menzies called Western Fundamentalism. So if I happen to make some sort of penetrating insight or say something particularly profound, uh, the chances are it's actually something that Gordon Menzies or Tim Keller just said, okay? But um, obviously, if I make any uh, incredibly stupid uh, comments or remarks, uh, well, that's Keith's fault. Okay, so if if you weren't here last week, um, 
Keith set out what modern idols are. And, uh, you know, Australians, we don't tend to go in for statues of, of gods and so forth, um, but we do, there are actually things that, that Australians worship and things that we, um, we, uh, we sacrifice to. But if we do have statues of, of deities or anything, generally they tend to be like sort of things we put in our garden to try and uh, bring back that vibe of the, uh, the holiday that we had in Bali or Koh Samui or something. The thing is, though, even those of us that, are, that identify as Christians, we are also prone to idolatry. And why is this the case? Well, let me, let me say this. It's, the thing about idols is that they're not necessarily the things that are made of stone or wood, but they're rather what those things represent. So if you want to work out what sort of idol you may be prone or vulnerable to having, let me ask you this. What is the thing that you have right now that if you lost, that almost all meaning and purpose would be drained out of your life? Or to put it another way, what is the thing that you have right now that if you lost, it could almost result in you losing the will to live? Now, I sometimes joke that if I have to spend more than 20 minutes at Park Beach Plaza in December, I can feel myself beginning to lose the will to live. But that's... That's not what we're talking about here. What is the thing that, that you currently have that if you lost, you could actually end up kind of feeling like just life wasn't worth living anymore? Because whatever that thing is, that's an idol. You know, when I ask myself this question, uh, the place that my mind go, goes to is Walter Mikak. Okay, so Walter Mikak, his wife, Nanette, and his daughter's six-year-old, Alana, and three-year-old Madeline were shot dead while they huddled behind a tree in Port Arthur in 1996. Now, if that were to happen to my family, I think that I would kind of feel like all purpose and meaning would just about be drained from my life. I would find that very hard to go on. Now, I'm really pleased to say that Walter McCack was able to rebuild his life after that incredible tragedy, and I'd like to think that I would be able to as well. But I have to say also that just the fact that I know how difficult that would be and that I may even be at the point of thinking about suicide or something, is that tells me a lot about my heart and my own vulnerability for idols as well. See, idols are not necessarily bad things. Idols um, can be very good things. And obviously, wives and, or families, partners, children, they're all good things, OK? They're, they're not bad things. And anyone who's who've had their family murdered, OK, they would be absolutely devastated by that. So I'm certainly not saying that, you know, if, if you, you know, it would be a bad thing if you considered suicide after something terrible like that happened. But what I am saying is that it's dangerous for us to have anything that's more fundamental to our happiness or our sense of security or who we are than God. So what is it for you? What's that thing that if you lost it, it would make your life seem meaningless or pointless? Is it your health? or your reputation, or your career, your, your life savings, your home. So our health, our careers, homes, relationships, even bank accounts, they're all good things, but they're not ultimate things. And that's the key. When they become ultimate things and take the place of God, they become idols. Now, is this a problem? Yeah, I think it's a problem for at least two reasons, okay? The first one is you can easily lose all of those things. So it's not very diff difficult for us right at the moment to imagine uh, someone in, in Ukraine that's lost their house, that's been destroyed, they probably have no job, um, you know, they've got nowhere to live, uh, they may well have had people in their family killed. Now, we're very fortunate in Australia that we don't face things like that at this point in time. But obviously, those sorts of things... You know, there's no reason for us to think that that could never happen to us. Those things do happen. So those things, if we put our hope and our trust and our security or our sense of belonging or, or meaning in those kinds of things, those sort of things that are created things, then we're vul very vulnerable if we lose those. But you see, no created thing can actually carry the weight of our soul's longings. And I say this as both a Christian and also as a psychologist. Okay, we all have longings. I don't know what you long for, but this is what I kind of long for. I long for my life to work. 
Okay, I long to, you know, to, for bad things not to happen to people that I care about. I long to um, have people in my life that care about me. And I long, I figure if, if, I, if I can keep all that together, if I can make those things happen, then I can actually make life work. And I'm guessing you're probably fairly similar to me in that way. That's a pretty normal kind of thing for people to, to want. It's a sort of normal kind of thing for us to long for. There's nothing wrong with that. But where is it that your heart finds its rest? Is it in your bank balance or relationship or your physical strength or your physical beauty? See, sometimes this is the thing, as I, as I think about my longings, sometimes I find myself straying into this kind of thought, which is like, as long as I can keep paying my insurance premiums, as long as I can keep working, as long as my health holds out, then I'll be able to earn enough money, I'll be able to look after my family and hopefully save for a nice retirement. Okay, if I can do all those things, I'll be okay, I've got this. And when my mind starts going down that route, that's when I'm actually in danger. I, I'm, I'm in danger of thinking, if I, can, if I can handle these things, if I can make these things happen, okay, if I've got this, I can make life work. I don't really need God. Maybe I might keep God as a backup plan. Okay, and that's the psychology of sin and idolatry. So instead of seeking God's kingdom first and his righteousness, we work out our independent plans to make life, to make life work without reference to God. And we end up worshipping idols instead of worshipping the living God. And this is one of, the, one of the signs of this is greed. Now, I want to show you a picture. I particularly like this picture because I think it kind of captures the idolatry of greed. It's like that, that little child is saying, you just keep your distance, all right? Because I've got things under control here and you're not going to mess things up. So this girl has so many dolls that she's hanging into, she can barely hold on to them all. She's got so many. See, one of the things we don't need to teach our kids is to be greedy, do they? Do we? And I think basically all of us come out of the womb with that one sorted out. But the funny thing is, though, that most people don't consider themselves greedy. Okay, I, think it's, I don't think it happens very often that the pastor gets a phone call from someone and they say, I'd like to talk to you because I'm concerned that I spent too much money on myself. Or I'm, I'm worried because I, I don't give enough money to charity. Okay, I don't think that happens. I don't think pastors get those sort of phone calls. It's interesting what, what Jesus says in Luke 12, isn't it? He says, watch out. Be on your guard against greed. In fact, against all kinds of greed. Now, why does Jesus say that? Okay, you see, because greed does tend to be something that we're unaware of. Okay, we have to be on our guard because it's really easy for us to be greedy. And I think this is true of all people. But I also think it's particularly true for those of us that live in um, countries like Australia where we have a specific vulnerability to greed. And I think that specific vulnerability is linked to something called a free market economy. I'll explain what I mean by that. The key term here is market. Okay, so the, that the, market is, the market is a very effective way of organising our society. And basically, life revolves around a series of trades. Okay, so basically if you have a job, you exchange your labour for money, and then you exchange that money for, for goods or, or shelter or, or food or whatever. Okay. In a free market, it's actually prices that tell both the customers and the producers what to do. Now, we're all familiar with the supermarket. Okay, we've all been there, and we know that lettuces have actually recently become quite expensive. And that's because basically there's a shortage of lettuce, which is mainly due to the weather. So when supply goes down, prices go up. Okay, prices discourage people from buying lettuce, and it encourages farmers to grow more of them. So the price of something is a very effective way of telling both the consumers and producers what to do. Now, it's not like that in all countries. Okay, in some countries, it's actually the government that controls prices and the whole economic system. So like in North Korea, when the, when the weather disrupts the supply of lettuces, someone goes around and says, stop eating lettuce. And then they go over to the farmers and they say, make more lettuce which unfortunately is not a particularly efficient way to run an economy, which is why you can see there's a fairly large disparity in prosperity between, say, North and South Korea. So free markets, free market economies have a number of benefits. They're good at creating wealth and lifting people out of poverty. But unfortunately, they also have a number of problems as well. 
See, markets work best when there's lots of buyers and lots of sellers. So, for example, in the labour market in Australia at the moment, it's a pretty good situation because there's a lot of people seeking to employ people and a lot of people seeking work. Okay, so both groups benefit. But in some places where there's few sellers and lots of buyers, there's a lot of uh, potential there for people to get exploited. So like, for example, in Coffs Harbour at the moment, the rental market is very tight. There's a lot of people looking for places to live and not all that many places to rent. So basically, if you um, are wealthy and you own a lot of places uh, that you're renting out, you can put the, the rents up and you don't even have to worry too much about doing maintenance on those properties because there's just so many people that are looking for somewhere to live. <clears throat> but there's relatively few places for them to live. So there's great potential, unfortunately, in a free market situation for that we, we could end up in a situation like the Hunger Games or um, Survivor or something, okay, where we have to, like, you know, outplay, outwit, out whatever the other one is. Um, it's survival of the fittest. And probably most of us can remember that, that those visions of um, people fighting over toilet paper in the supermarket in 2020... See, if markets were left completely to themselves, if they were completely free, it would be survival of the fittest. And basically, those that were um, poor and weak, they would be crushed, and the strong would actually prosper. Which is also why, um, in Australia, the government does have some rules about how markets operate. And sometimes the government actually stops in, or, or rather stands, uh, they step in, and they actually manage markets, like the other week when we are all looking like we might run out of electricity. But here's the thing, free market economies do present some particular challenges for us, I think, as Christians, because it's the air that we breathe, it's the social air that we breathe, it's just the economic system that we've always been in and we figure it's just like normal, we take it for granted. But the market doesn't have a conscience and it doesn't have morals. And we can end up thinking that life is just basically like a series of trades that we do and the idea is to get the best deal for us. And that's actually not how Jesus tells us to live. Plus, we also live in, a con in an, an economy where we're constantly encouraged to buy things that we don't really need. And as uh, Reuben said before, you know, we we'll often get these messages, that quick, buy it now, because it won't be on sale for much longer, or you know, get two for one, or, or whatever. You know, there was a time not so long ago when most people probably needed a watch. Today, a lot of people don't have a watch because they carry a mobile phone, so that, that's easy for them to tell time. But you can actually still buy watches. Um, in fact, um, you can buy watches like, I don't know if you've ever seen, like a Rolex watch. Um, but basically, um, Rolex watches, like this one, um, are, are really quite um, fantastic. And um, when I looked at the website to see this particular, this particular watch, I was kind of curious to see how much it was, and it said um, price on application, or pr price on request, which I, I think basically means something like, um, if you have to ask how much it is, you probably can't afford it, buddy. So, but the thing about a Rolex watch, it's actually, it's not, it's, you don't buy Rolex watches to tell the time, do you? Okay? It's basically, it's a prestige band. You buy prestige brand, sorry. It's probably got a prestige band as well. But it's a prestige brand... Um, which basically you buy it because it says something about you, okay? It's a, it's a sign of success. It's an identity thing. It's not a time-telling thing. Now, I think all of us um, probably feel that kind of the pull of brands at different times, whether it's watches or clothes or cars or technology or whatever. We, um, we buy a lot of stuff because we, we get sucked into the lie that basically if we buy this thing then we will feel really good about ourselves or it'll bring something to our life that we think will be really fantastic. Now, last week when Keith was talking to us, he told us about the time in his life where he convinced himself to sell his car so he could buy a computer. But unfortunately, the computer didn't end up being quite as exciting or as useful as he was hoping for. Now, um, the other day I came across on the, the internet someone called Randy Gage. Now, um, I'm not sure who uh, Randy Gage is, uh, but I'm sure he's a lovely fellow. Uh, he certainly dresses well, uh, and he seems to have a very nice car as well. And I, uh, in fact, I think he's probably got a very nice car and a computer, I, I would say. And I'm sure that under that very nice tailored uh, sleeve on his suit, he's probably wearing a Rolex watch. He probably has a fridge full of lettuce as well, I would say, as well. But he tells us to live our dreams. 
Now, I don't, I don't know about your dreams. What do you guys dream about? Actually, it's probably better you don't answer that. You shouldn't tell me, because I'm a psychologist. It's always a bit risky telling a psychologist what you dream about. I'll tell you what I dream about. Okay, I have this recurring dream. Uh, I'm back in year 11. It's Monday morning. I'm at school. And there's a maths test, which I'd forgotten about, and I'm completely unprepared for. That's not the worst part of it, though, um, because I also notice that I'm stark naked. Um, but no one else appears to have noticed that yet. But I know that it's only a matter of time. And it's really, really awkward and uncomfortable. I call it the nudie dream. Uh, it's awful. So please, Randy, don't tell me to live my dreams. That's the last thing I want. But things like um, those kinds of those images, oh, live your dreams, it's the modern... Um, idol of materialism, isn't it? Okay, so the idea that our identity and our value as a person comes from what we own uh, and what we look like. I mean, what a con! Okay, that's, it's like we end up chasing this rainbow of spending our way into fulfilment. You know, someone once summed up late modern capitalism as this. They said, we buy things with money we don't have to impress people that we don't like. It's silly. And it doesn't work. It's idolatry. See, watches, clothes, cars, technology, any consumer item, they're not bad things. They're all good things. But they'll never quite deliver the level of happiness that we want to try and get from them. Okay, because that's because they're not ultimate things. They're created things. And only our creator can actually give us that level of fulfilment that we so desperately desire and we so desperately need. Jesus said, watch out, be on guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. Here's the good news, though. You can actually get off that merry-go-round of consumerism and greed and and trying to get that thing which you think is going to actually make life work for you. And the way to do that is not by trying really, really hard and gritting your teeth and trying to be generous when you don't want to. It's actually by changing the currency of your heart, by understanding how Jesus poured out his wealth for you. If you've still got your Bibles open, flick over to Luke chapter 19. I just want to talk a little bit about Zacchaeus. Okay, Zacchaeus was probably a fairly unpleasant sort of guy, um, he certainly would have had few friends. See, not only was he a tax collector, but he was also the chief ta a chief tax collector in, in the town of Jericho. Now, the Romans, they conquered Judea in about 63 BC, and um, what the Romans would do after they conquered a country is that they would make the inhabitants of that country pay tax to Rome. And this achieved two things. First of all, it made Rome very rich, and it also pretty much gutted the country that they had conquered, which made it less likely that the country would rebel. So the Romans used local collaborators to collect those taxes. And um, as a Jew, it would have been social suicide to become a tax collector. But you could also become very rich, because you could basically collect a whole lot more tax than you really needed to and, and skim some, some off the top and keep it for yourself. So Zacchaeus was very rich and also very greedy. And which, and, but, you know, he, uh, he was also a fairly short guy as well, so possibly that was why he was keen on ripping people off. I don't know. But certainly by the time Jesus was moving through Jericho, Jesus, Zacchaeus had probably heard about Jesus because he'd had a reputation by that time as being someone that hung out with social undesirables like tax collectors. Maybe that's why Zacchaeus was keen to see him. The fact that Zacchaeus climbed a tree to see Jesus as well, I think kind of hints to some level of desperation on his part to see who this Jesus person was. Okay, because Jewish men didn't climb trees, particularly adult Jewish men, they, they didn't climb trees for, for fun. Okay, it was very undignified. He would have looked silly climbing a tree. But, you know, I think the fact that he did that hints towards some of the desperation that Zacchaeus was probably feeling. And to the surprise of Zacchaeus, and I think the dismay of many of the people in the crowd that were following Jesus along the road, Jesus says to Zacchaeus, come down because I need to be at your place. 
Now, most of the crowd following Jesus, I'm sure they were very respectable, um, good Jewish people, and as such, they would never have, like, gone... I mean, they wouldn't speak to Zacchaeus, let alone go to his house. So I think they were probably kind of pretty dismayed by what Jesus had said, because Jesus basically he'd picked the biggest scumbag on the road that day to go and have lunch with. Now, Zacchaeus desperately wanted a relationship with Jesus... But Zacchaeus also realised that he had a problem with money. But suddenly the money that he had just didn't seem so important to him anymore. It it lost its currency in his heart. See, being in a relationship with Jesus became much more important than the money that Zacchaeus had. And he was happy to give half of it away to the poor straight away and then to reimburse people that he might have ripped off in the past. See, his money was no longer as valuable as being known and loved by God and accepted by God. God had become the ultimate thing in Zacchaeus's life. Now notice what Jesus says in response to what Zacchaeus has done. He says, Jesus says, salvation has come to this house. Which is also interesting because note what he doesn't say. He doesn't say, if you get your life together, then salvation will come to this house. See, God's, God's salvation comes in response to wrong. God's salvation does not come in response to a changed life. Okay, it's actually the other way around. Okay? A changed life comes in response to God's salvation, which is offered to us as a free gift. And it's really important, that point. In fact, I, I must say it again. God's salvation does not come in response to a changed life, but it comes... In response to salvation which is offered to us as a free gift so if you think that giving money away is a requirement for God's salvation then you're going to start asking yourself well how much do I have to give but if you understand that salvation is offered to you as a free gift then that really changes everything okay you want you naturally you want to be generous okay you no longer see so you no longer see money as being something that you know, you've got to really hold on to tightly or that it's your salvation or the way you're going to make it through life. You see money as basically being something that you can use to help other people and to do good with. See, meeting Jesus changed the currency of Zacchaeus's heart. Now, not long after that encounter uh, with Zacchaeus, Jesus uh, went to Jerusalem and he was quite um, brutally executed. And Jesus died to pay for all the wrong that Zacchaeus had done to his fellow Jews. But Jesus also died (coughs) to pay for all the wrong that we've done as well. For all the times that we've ripped her people off. For all the times when we've broken God's commandments. When we haven't loved God with our whole heart. And when we haven't loved our neighbours as ourselves for the way that we've set up idols in our hearts and worshipped them instead of worshipping the God who created us. Now, none of us are any more deserving of the love of Jesus than Zacchaeus was. Now, when the Apostle Paul was writing to the church in Corinth, he was, trying to, he was encouraging them to be generous. And this is what he said. He said, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, though he was rich, Yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. So Jesus had all the wealth in the universe, but if he had held on to it, we would have died in spiritual poverty. Okay, if he stayed rich, we die poor. But instead he died poor so that we can become rich. Our sins can be forgiven and we can enter the family of God. We can be put right with God. And the extent to which we can grasp that truth is the extent to which we can also resist greed and resist the temptation for money to become our idol and instead mirror the generosity of Jesus in all areas of our lives. So I want to finish just by suggesting a few practical things that we can do to avoid greed and to encourage generosity. Firstly, understand that your time, your treasure and your talents are given to you by God and you're accountable for how you use them. You're not accountable to me for how you use them, but you're accountable to God for how you use them. 
that God's actually interested in how and what we do with our time and our, and our money uh, and our talents. So it's good to talk to God regularly about that. And I'm just saying that because I don't know if you've ever thought about it like that before. Okay, if, you know, maybe you might think, well, look, I work jolly hard to, to make the money that I, that I make and, you know, I, it's, it's, it's entirely up to me what I do with it. And it certainly isn't any of my business how you spend your money. But it's pretty clear from the Bible that there is an expectation that God's people will be generous, that they'll give to the poor, and that they'll also financially support um, the, the, the activities of spreading the gospel. So it's really easy for us to get caught up with money. We need to learn how to manage money well, and we also need to learn to not hang on to it too tightly. When uh, we started giving our kids pocket money, we actually gave them, gave them pocket money and we gave them three... three um, money boxes and we said put some money uh, in a money box uh, to spend some to save and some to give away so I think if you start doing that with kids when they're young then I hope when they've got a few dollars so when they start to earn lots of dollars that they might be able to continue on doing that of course you need to be doing that yourself uh, as well uh, if you want to teach your kids to do this because kids are great at spotting hypocrisy um, with their parents you know, according to the National Church Life Survey, which we did here in our church in February of this year, 67% of people that responded to the survey said that they'd given money to a charity in the last 12 months, which is fantastic. And if, if you're one of the one-third that hadn't given uh, money to a charity in the last 12 months, well, perhaps that's something you might like to think about. You know, we're not the sort of church that puts a lot of emphasis on things like people supporting the church financial, which is basically because we don't really have to. Okay, people are very generous in our, in, our, uh, in our church here in contributing financially to the ministries that we have here in Harborside. And I think that's, people are very gen generous, I and mean, I think that's basically because they understand that that's, that's what the Bible teaches us to do. And if this is your, your spiritual home and you're not currently supporting the the um, financially the ministries that we have here at Harborside, well, I'd encourage you to think about that as well. So again, according to our NCLS data from the people that, um, that responded to that in February, about 75% of us regularly uh, give to church and give around about 10% of our net income. There was another 10% um, uh, um, that basically said that uh, they, they give money or a small amount when they come to church, and there was about 15% that said that they don't contribute financially at all. So, you know, we're pretty transparent with our finances here. Um, uh, each month you can see in, in the bulletin about whether we made budget previous month, month or how we're doing in terms of our budget for the whole year. Okay, we could do better, but we're doing okay. I don't feel an, under any pressure, or, uh, sorry, I don't feel any, under any need to put pressure on people to give more. But I do feel it's really important to point out that it's so easy for us to become greedy with money and to make it an idol. See, generosity is something that's in this life, it's a blessing to both ourselves and to other people as well. If we, it helps us to grow in spiritual maturity and it blesses others, so it's a win-win. Now, someone uh, in my family recently ran out of petrol in a, on a busy street in Sydney or a busy road in Sydney. And a kind person stopped to see what the problem was. And when, when they found out what the problem was, this kind person drove to a service station, filled up a container and came back and put petrol uh, in, the, in the car of, of these people in my family. Um, now, whilst the guy was off getting petrol, the people in my family, they're kind of feeling a bit awkward because they're thinking, like most of us, like, they weren't carrying very much cash. And so they're thinking, well, what do we do? We've got to do sort of this guy's, like, get his financial details and maybe try and do some electronic funds transfer on our phone or something or other. But when the guy came back, he was having none of it. He said, no, don't, don't worry about it. He said, you guys have a great day and uh, you know, pay it forward if you get the chance sometime in the future. And he drove off. Now, the people in the car that run our petrol, they were just stunned. And they were also so happy, it completely made their day. They were so happy. Now, you know, I'm pretty certain that the stranger, as, as he drove off, probably figured that was the best 20 or 30 bucks he'd spent all week. Because he knew he'd really helped out someone. He'd done a good thing. You know, it's just, it would have made his day as well. Now, I don't know if the stranger was a Christian. Maybe he was, maybe it wasn't. It's not just Christians that do those sorts of things. 
but Christians should do those sorts of things. Okay, let's be on the lookout for opportunities for us to graciously be generous to other people. Okay, so look for opportunities to be generous to strangers, or better yet, be generous to people that don't like you. Because that's what Jesus tells us to do. Be generous to people. And don't put it on social media or stuff like that. Just between you and God. Be generous to people. Okay? It's, it's, a way to, it's a way to be obedient to God, but it's also a way to bless other people uh, and grow in spiritual maturity ourselves. Okay, so remember that God's salvation does not come in response to a changed life. A changed life comes in response to God's salvation, which he offers to us as a free gift I just want to come back to that, that little girl that we talked about a little bit um, earlier in the sermon, okay? Remember this kid? What do you reckon a good parent would say to that child? I think a good parent would probably pick her up and put her on their knee and probably say, my precious daughter, I'm your parent and I love you. I'll care for you and I'll make sure you have what you need. You don't have to face life on your own and you can trust in my goodness for you. Now, you have three lovely dolls and you have me. So why don't you make someone's day and give a couple of dolls away to someone else that's got none? I just want to finish with that verse from Corinthians again. You know, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. Let's pray. Father, it's hard for us to get our heads around the incredible depth of your generosity to us, the grace that you offer us, a relationship with you that was very, very costly to Jesus and yet is offered freely to us. Father, help us to more and more understand the depth of that grace. Father, help us more and more to be um, in love with you to put you first in our lives, to have our lives centred on you and to worship you. Father, we pray also that you will help us not to be greedy. Father, help us to be people that are generous. Um, help us, Lord, to be people that can uh, demonstrate and, and um, reflect the character of your son, Jesus, and that his name might be, uh, might be known and your name might be made great. And we pray this in Jesus' name.